Hi, in this slide I want to talk about how when we start down the line item profit analytics journey, we start looking at, at uh, rocks and stumps and, and after a while it adds up to, oh my gosh, it's a forest and it's got a living edge to it, a dying edge to it. In other words, bigger themes, guidelines start to emerge. Uh, by looking at ranking reports, we realize there are much more powerful power laws than 2080 and that allows us to kind of focus on the 555 approach uh, within a, a number one niche of customer. Um, also, within a, we can take these customers and we can do a customer or an item profitability, a, a popularity profitability ranking report, and that allow us to zero in on the most profitable items and beef them up from a fill rate viewpoint, figure out the biggest losing items, which are also massively popular, how to fix those, and then beef them up from a fill rate viewpoint. We realize that there's the sea of small customers that needs a different service model. Um, we realized that we should really be in business of doing value exchange management. Our goal should be 100% of our customers should very quickly become net profitable. Why on earth should we ever do business on an ongoing long-term basis and just lose money on a steady basis? It just, it's a, it's a drain. It keeps us from taking care of other customers even better. Um, we find out that because of the law of reciprocal uh, uh, activity costs that, um, in lose-lose situations with customers, we can actually go out and start a different conversation and come up with a different way of doing business that removes friction for both sides of the coin. And so we both win and they give us more business, which is great. But to do go out and visit with best customers and tune their models higher and better to go out to biggest losers and sort of redesign those models, who is our vice president of service value chain solutions. Because a sales rep typically goes out and calls on a buyer who's doing a turn the crank demand replenishment activity. They're in their silo doing their thing with their paperwork and their metrics. Um, and they don't see the bigger system. They don't see the whole elephant. They're just, their job is to focus on the tusk. Um, so we need to get to somebody who can see the whole elephant and say, oh, I get it. So we can we can take care of our Tusk metrics and, 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 there's lots more that we can work on together. Great, let's do it. Uh, obviously, to make salespeople part of the solution and to embrace and believe in all this, we have to do proactively sell, teach, install, demand replenishment practices with the best customers, and the salespeople have to be able to do that. So they need to be supply chain, selling skills, fluent and able. And of course, now we can put all the employees uh, on a net profit development because it isn't just improvement. I mean, there are some accounts where we could just say, look, you know, uh, you're going to have to buy more from us half, you know, twice as much. Uh, we're unbundling freight, raising prices. Um, that's, that's profit improvement. But when we actually go out and we talk about supply chain tweaking and tunings and so forth with big customers, that's development. And because of that, that's why we get big, much bigger share gains in those accounts. So those are some of the things that start to emerge. Nicheonomics, hyper-focus and 555 marketing, uh, the small order, small customer division, um, the, the idea that we are going to go out and now get in the demand replenishment supply chain business also. Um, things we hadn't really thought about before. Thank you.